All right, I think I am safe here from Karen. Time for a Lotus Amira update because I passed break-in, which was a thousand miles, did my oil change. I've been driving it a few hundred miles since then post break-in and being able to push it very much changes the experience for me when I own a sports car. I also recently got the 2024 Mazda Miata ND3 Club with Brembo BBS Recaro package. And having that car with this car gives me a little bit more context because I'm used to more of this kind of vehicle. FRS I had for nine years, GR86 I had for almost two years, and I'm gonna be taking this to the track at the end of the month. So if you wanna see updates on that, make sure you subscribe. Now, one unique thing about owning a car like this for the first time is you're worrying about actually scraping the front because the FRS and GR86 I had, they weren't too low and the, the Amira actually isn't all that low and I was able to park here without scraping but I had to be very careful. But I didn't like having to be careful so I got this Bridget ramp because I saw some neighbors who have these, actually multiple and they all actually have Corvette C8s which I thought was pretty funny. But using this ramp so that I can take the car in and out without issue. Tell you more about the things that have changed recently, including these mats. Let's first get her. I love that too, by the way. One, three, three, seven miles. Get like me, if you know, you know. I still have not gotten the, um, some guys on the forums were creating these 3D printed mats that integrated the wireless phone charger for your, you know, your MagSafe, your uh, iPhone and such. And I'll tell you more about that in a sec, but reversing in this tiny spot, I'm just dreading that one day I might scrape the sides. You press both the L and R buttons at the same time, it'll fold the side views in and out. That's from the, the Volvo connection. Gotta love that. Home link coming standard, thank you. Wish my Miata had that. And there we go, over the Bridget. No worries about the front scraping as a result. So there's a guy on the forums who's making these 3D printed phone mats and they have the MagSafe charger built in, wraps it in Alcantara, looks really slick, especially if you have Alcantara interior. I don't, I have leather, but still, uh, it would match if you had Alcantara, looks really nice. But. I think he's charging like 275 or so, but the reason I didn't want to proceed is less about the price and more that, you know, he, he's saying send money on PayPal friends and family, which as a buyer, you then lose all kind of protections. But more importantly, he says it's because he doesn't make much income per unit. He doesn't make much profit because he's, you know, the price of parts and such and uh, he doesn't want to pay taxes on, on what little money he makes. And I'm like, okay, dude, I don't want to help you evade taxes, and that just doesn't seem right to me. So not gonna support that. And yeah, I'm sure you are making a, a healthy profit, which you should be. I think there's nothing wrong with making a healthy profit. If people, you know, supply and demand, if people are willing to pay for that, you should charge 275 or whatever it is, even though your materials are gonna be probably 50, 60, 80 bucks tops. But let me tell you more about the car and what I've done since last time. So I originally got the car tinted and the original tint job, I don't know if you guys saw in the prior videos, was, was actually, all right, move the car because Karen was teaching her daughter how to drive a truck and somehow I was in the way. All right, so experience with the car. I initially got this thing tinted and the tint job wasn't great so I went to, I think it's called Precision Auto Tinting here in Vegas, and they did a fantastic job. So I did 50-5-0 on the front windshield, which normally, if I was in California or other places, I wouldn't even touch, but because of the heat in Vegas, very much worth it to get uh, ceramic, especially the higher end ceramic, like nano ceramic that blocks a lot of the heat. And I went initially with 5% on the sides, which was silly, it got way too dark, and driving at night, I didn't enjoy. So I went back to 15, which is what I initially had. I had 15 with the old tint, removed that tint, went to five. That was too dark, went back to 15. I think 15 uh, for me is the sweet spot. And there's also this tiny window in the back here, which I believe is 
35. And the reason I didn't go 15 is because it's so small and it's already covered by this other glass here. And I think doing 35, or maybe, sorry, maybe it was 20. Oh, I forget. But I didn't want it as dark as the sides because there's already less light hitting there. And I think that was the right call because now it feels more consistent. In terms of other changes to the car, we got these Wita mats. These are a version 2.0 or maybe 3.0. Not sure how many versions they've made. The first version didn't really fit quite properly and there were lifting edges and just wasn't ideal. But these new mats, I'm enjoying quite a bit. They sit flush and they put Velcro. As you can see here, they give you this double-sided tape or rather it's, you know, you stick one piece of Velcro here and there's a Velcro there and boom. Keeps things nice and flush. I think the looks are gonna be polarizing. It's a little bit more of like a luxurious feel. I used to always do WeatherTech mats in my prior cars, but WeatherTech does not offer a mat for the Lotus Amira, and Wita Mat has these, which offer actually better coverage than what I would ever get from um, WeatherTech. Covers the sides here and all the way up. And if you guys have seen the OEM floor mats, they generally are only this little square right there. So the, the angled part at the front where your feet will actually go, don't actually get covered, which is a, a problem in my mind. So happy with that. And if you can see in there, it even covers the side part of where your foot, when you're resting on the dead pedal, you know, the little side piece there is covered too. They did a great job. Very happy with that. Seating position. There's been a lot of talk about this. I think because of the styling, because normally your belt line is pretty straight across, but because of the styling, this actually slopes down. And because this slopes down, it makes you feel like you're sitting higher up compared to the window. See how this slopes down? That is one reason why many people feel like they're sitting too high in the car. And the second reason is that the roof line right here is quite low as well. Especially if you're a taller driver, it's gonna be much closer to you than what you expect. That's another reason you may feel like you're sitting too high, but I recall when I sat in the Evora, that feeling of the roof line being quite low is also present there. And it's because it has this very sporty silhouette, nice and low and curved like that. In reality, the way you sit, if you were to measure things and see where your butt actually sits right there, look how low it is to the ground. You actually have a very nice seating position. The ergonomics of the pedal is not ideal. You do have to shift a little bit to the right, but you get used to that very quickly. No issue. Pushing the car more has allowed me to definitely enjoy it far more than when I had to baby it during break-in. No surprises there. I'm the kind of guy that loves pushing his cars pretty hard. And having a Miata allows me to experience that in a different way because with the Miata, you can push things at low speed. You can approach the limit uh, in a safer way. And with this car, if you want to stretch its legs or get the tail out a little bit, you can't do it on as many roads. You have to be much more selective. 400 horsepower, 3,100 pounds. Um, whereas the Miata, much lighter, skinnier tires, lower grip, not Cup 2s, right? Like we have here. Uh, for those who don't know, this is the Sport chassis and that comes with the Michelin Cup 2 tires, 245 section width and 295 in the rear. Finally got the dash cams properly installed. When you guys first saw my uh, initial uh, purchase video, you'll see that I loosely put something up here and the wire was hanging but I got it hardwired by this gentleman. His company details are in the description if you're interested, I'm getting the, the name of his company. But we hardwired it using the hardwire kit, goes to the fuse box in there and it's like wrapped around so it's, it's seamless. It also tracks down here, up and around and goes to the rear. And I have that rear camera as well. A lot of people think this is overkill, but for me, in every one of my cars, I always put a Viofo dash cam because First of all, Biofo has the nice like wedge shape, which is a little bit more um, slim profile, not as easy to see from the outside. I don't want to have like this thing hanging that's really big and bulky and says, hey, car thieves, come break in and steal my you know $200 camera or whatever it is. So I like the thin profile. They also always use the top tier sensors, which I think is the Starvis 2 or something right now. But yeah, I've been using variations of them since 2014. And by hardwiring it, it's more just for my insurance, right? If something were to happen and it's he said, she said, or a hit and run, then I don't have to worry about things. The dash cam provides peace of mind. And when you're pushing it, let's say on the track as an example, 
then you can pull the footage from there and actually use it for, I don't know, just to study your driving and improve and, and things like that. Whole car has been PPF'd. You have to look really closely to even see that. They did a fantastic job. It was the guys over at Vegas Auto Gallery, True Artisans, they did a phenomenal job. Uh, they actually invited me to come there and, and learn from them, you know, how to do PPF properly, things to look out for. And after I think two weeks, you let the PPF set, took it back in and they fix, you know, little tiny, tiny bubbles. They poke those out. And now when you look at the car, you can't even tell, but again, peace of mind. So when I go to the racetrack, I'm not worried about rock chips or even just driving around town, not as worried about rock chips. I can enjoy the vehicle the way it was meant to be. Oh, <sighs> Karen has now brought her daughter here. All right, I think I am safe here from Karen. That is terrorizing the streets. Um, so obviously as the first nice fancy car that I've ever owned, I'm a little bit more precious, a little bit more babying with this car than any car I've had before. Like the FRS, when I actually first got that, I definitely did uh, baby that and I took very good care of it. And I even got that on the front end PPF, which in hindsight I regret, but it just meant so much. It has so much sentimental value to me it represented so much that, um, you know, I, I felt that way for a few years and then eventually I was able to see it as just a tool to bring me happiness. So maybe the same thing will happen here. I think part of it too is when you're buying an expensive car, you know, also earlier in your career, then it, you know, even just financially, it's a bigger hit if something were to happen to it, right? Versus I hope in 10 years, it won't be as big of a deal. Um, and not that I'm gonna not care about a car like this in 10 years, but I don't have to be hopefully as precious about it. I'm not gonna be worried about PPFing the whole thing, all that stuff. So just a disclaimer for you guys, since depending on where you are in your car purchasing journey, you may or may not feel the same way that I do. But I mean, goddamn, this thing is <laughs> absolutely stunning. The ride quality with Sport is still very enjoyable. Um, one thing I was expecting was that the Miata would be more fun driving around the streets and this would be more fun only on certain twisty canyon roads and on the racetrack we're gonna find out on the racetrack if that's the case or not i'm hoping it is but the front end it just it washes out quite a bit compared to the cayman as an example you have to remember this is i think 3961 front to rear weight distribution that's part of it but it's also partially the tuning and the alignment unfortunately what i've read so far on the forums is that you can't actually change the front camber much I mean, with double wishbone, you get that dynamic negative, negative camber change. And in theory, that's gonna be far superior on the racetrack, but the way they've tuned it is such that it is more understeer prone. And you kinda need to drive this thing almost like a 911, not quite, the weight isn't quite as far back. And it doesn't have as much of that lightening of the front end, like a 996 or a 997. But it's also not a car that acts like a Cayman, where it feels a little bit more balanced out of the box. This does have that understeer prone nature, but don't be mistaken because with the weight transfer, with you know how you time the throttle and how aggressive you are on the throttle, you can absolutely get the tail out and get it to dance with you and wiggle a bit. So overall, I would say driving dynamics, far more enjoyable on the canyons in my experience compared to a Cayman. Far more enjoyable driving around the streets, the boring streets where most of us are driving most of the time, because even driving slow, this thing feels like a special occasion. Exposed shifter linkages, the sounds, seeing the supercharger bypass valve in the rear view, all the little touch points, the interior, it just feels so special every time you drive it. Going out on dates in this car makes the whole date feel more fun as well. The Cayman has the theoretically inferior strut front and strut rear, but the way they've tuned it and set it up, I think is, Far more balanced part of that is the weight distribution that one is 45 55 front to rear and even on the track i need to drive more camas on the track and drive this on the track to compare but i have a sense that the cayman is going to be a little bit more predictable and do what you want to be a little bit more stable whereas this <laughs> i'm hoping it's not the case that it just becomes very frustrating trying to work around that front end for those wondering, the oil change isn't so bad. It took me a lot longer than it should have the first time because it didn't really, you know, th there aren't any videos out there for the Amira. They, they're out there for the Avora, which is very similar. Of course, the same powertrain, but you know, the plastic trim pieces and the aero panels on the bottom and which bolts you need to remove and all that stuff. Um, took me a bit longer than expected, but it's not too bad of an oil change. I just personally don't enjoy working on my car as much as a lot of you guys 
So I've done it a lot on my FRS and my GR86 out of necessity just because of cost savings. But with this car, since I'm only gonna be tracking it occasionally, moving forward, I'll probably just get it done by a local shop. That is one of the nice things though, is with the Toyota powertrain, you're not paying crazy fees for something like an oil change, or if you do it yourself or you need parts, it's not exorbitantly expensive. And I use the Mobile One European Car Formula 0W40, which is, I believe what's recommended online on the forums for a lot of the Avoras as well as for the Amira. No oil temp gauge, which is an oversight for a car that they say you can take to the track, but uh, probably not gonna worry about it since I won't be taking it to the track that often. And even when I do take it to the track, it's not gonna be a car that I'm pushing 10 tenths the way I did with the GR86. It'll be more like a nine and a half tenths car where uh, I don't want to bin it, I don't want to have offs with it if I can avoid it. Um, speaking of which, that reminds me of the NSX because I feel like the Acura NSX is very much a sim similar lineage to this car, same kind of ethos. And some would argue that the Cayman, you know, they both, this, the Cayman and the NSX naturally aspirated six cylinders, manual transmission, mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, but, the way the Cayman drives, I find very different to the NSX. And I find this more aligned with the NSX than the Cayman. Even with the NSX, you feel the front end uh, being much lighter. And you have to remember, this is an unassisted steering rack on the NSX. You feel that more, I'm not sure what the actual weight distribution is, but the front end feels a lot lighter in the NSX versus something like a Cayman. The front end here feels lighter as well. But the reason I feel like this and the NSX are very similar behind the wheel is, I mean, both have this great visibility, both are incredibly enjoyable to drive even slowly around the city streets, two tenths, three tenths, very enjoyable, both cars. Both cars feel so special when you're even just sitting in the driver's seat, the visibility, the cockpit, the ergonomics, the design, the interior. I mean, the NSX, of course, inspired by the F-16, as we all know, this one, still has its own special thing going on. I obviously haven't driven this on track yet. I also have not driven an NSX on track yet, but my sense right now is that the Cayman might be, especially in GT4 trim, which again, is not really the direct competitor to this. The GTS 4.0 would be more of a direct competitor, but my sense is that the Cayman would be a little bit more at home on the racetrack, whereas the NSX and Amira NSX especially because of the older technology, but if you modify it appropriately, of course, it'll be fine. Uh, but if we're talking more stock or more OEM plus builds, then I feel like both this and the NSX are very much enjoyable from zero all the way up to seven, eight tenths. And when you start pushing it harder, you are going to feel a little bit more of those deficiencies. Again, that's just my sense right now, but we'll see once I do take it on the track. Next steps for the car. I do want to do a bit more research on alignment adjustments for the front, especially. Some companies might come out with adjustable arms, upper control arms and such. Uh, right now, my understanding is that there isn't really much you can do. I do wanna do a third cat delete just to open up the sound a little bit, but the Valvetronic exhaust, I know for my old man ears are probably gonna be too loud. So third cat delete will likely do uh, enough for me. And then eventually I wanna do a tune as well to bring up the red line to 7200 RPM rather than the current 6800 RPM, as well as um, giving you a little bit more power to work with as well. Well, my friends, really happy with this car. Again, the biggest surprise recently has just been that I still enjoy driving this more than my Miata. Um, I guess the Miata, you really need to toss it around and fling it around corners to, for, for me to enjoy it as much. Whereas this car, even if I'm not pushing it as hard, I find a lot of joy in the driver's seat. And that, my friends, are some updates on my 2024 Lotus Amira First Edition. If you have a car in Las Vegas and you want me to do a review comparison of the Amira versus your car, then visit us on jabalincars.com, follow the form on the homepage. Much love, my friends. See you all in the next one.